yo. What we don't start it. Look at what we don't start it. This the people party. What's up, party people? It's Talib Kweli. This is the People's Party. We are back for another week of fantastic cultural conversation. Give it up for my lovely and talented and thoughtful co-host, Jasmine Lee, in the house. What's up, Jasmine? What's up? I need some feeling? claps. I can't clap. I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Well, I know you how do? you're doing. I can tell by your Instagram. <laughs> my Instagram is legendary. I had the best weekend of my entire life. Yes, I can. I'm very jealous, but I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> now, one of the reasons why I had such a good weekend is because of this guest that we have coming on today. This guest that we have coming on today is one of my favorite people on earth. He's one of the chief inspirations for my musical career. He is a co-founder of the legendary Roots Crew. He played a major role in the whole Soulquarian era of hip hop music. And by the way, he came up with the name Soulquarian. Um, from Organics to Do You Want More to Illadelf Half-Life, him and his band was killing shit in the hip hop scene. In 1999, Things Fall Apart, that album really cemented their place in black music. Um, while most bands fall apart, literally, um, the roots kept going. They dropped Phrenology, Tipping Point, Game Theory, Rising Down, How I Got Over, all in the 2000s. That's a lot of output. This man is very prolific. I read an interview once where he said he doesn't consider himself creative, but I don't see how that's possible with this resume. Um, his memoir, Mo Meta Blues, dropped in 2013. You can buy his books at qualiclub.com uh, and the Akira Books section. He's also written other books, uh, Creative Quests, Something to Food About. Man, he is the creator, one of the creators of OK Player. Uh, his band is on the Jimmy Fallon show. <sighs> I could, this whole episode could be this man's resume, so we just- And now the show's over. Thank you very much, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. Give it up to Questlove from the Roots, from the Roots crew, Mayor Questlove Thompson is in the house. Thank you. What's up, Questlove? You know what, Kweli? Mm -hmm. I'm at a, I'm at a, I'm at a transformative place in my life right now mm -hmm. where I absolutely abhorred, um, like uh, any any recapitulation of my resume mm -hmm. or things that I've done, like it's next to getting teeth pulled <laughs> to hear anyone publicly celebrate or or note of any achievements I've done used to make me just like I, I, I would inherently try to make myself small and not own those things. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that. This weekend that we're experiencing has is pretty much been. I mean, more than just for what what happened artistically. Mm -hmm. I think spiritually and socially, like what's been going on, which people will see on your pl platform throughout the weeks or whatever. But um, yeah, I'm I'm now to a place where I'm sort of ready to take baby steps and. Feeling good because like nothing makes me more uncomfortable than being like singled out mm -hmm. like bad ways and good ways. Right. You know what I mean? Like I, I just I think I've tried to live a life uh, being invisible while in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And so that was really hard for me to sit through. Thank you for those <laughs> kind words. It was really hard for me to sit through. <laughs> well, you got to you got to own your shit. You got to reclaim and your accept time. Those things. You know, it's like um. You are you are that guy. And I hear what you're saying because your whole movement has been the legendary Roots crew. Your whole movement has been the Soul Quarian crew. Like you were influenced by Native Tongues right. in the same way I was. And so I think you're someone mm -hmm. who understands the power of the collective and you've always strived to achieve that. Literally. I mean, you know, one of, one of the key components of, you know, my life and my journey um, you know, a gentleman who's not here right now, but Richard Nichols, um, who was really like somewhere between like our father figure and mm -hmm. our manager. He was such a guiding light uh, in our lives. And I remember when we were um, exiling in London, literally trying to figure out the sun, like in, in, in sort of a game theory like way. I mean, the reason why we named it game theory is like Rich taught us about game theory back in like 1992, 93, where we would actually try to figure out the numerical likelihood of us 
getting to the other side or us like finally reaching a, a place where like our music connects to people. And, um, you know, it was, it was in the summer of 1995 in which he came up with a, an actual like math formula and figured that it was going to take us four years, four years to paradigm shift so that we, this slows down and we reverse our fortunes. And one, one of the things that he said was like, um, well, for starters, we're isolated here in London. Like, we don't have a family base. So the first mm-hmm. thing we have to do when we get back is, well, he said, grow our own crops. Mm. And he says, we do that by having these jam sessions. So starting with, like, those very first jam sessions that were, like, in our living room in the very beginning, mm-hmm. like, pre-Black Lily jam sessions and what eventually happened at Wetlands. Like, you know, that that was a plan. Like, if we can... Because we know it's like everyone else like had a click. Like, mm-hmm. oh, Motown has a click. Prince had a click. Wu-Tang had a click. Uh, even not by design. Like, I mean, all the anyone associated with Disney would roll their eyes in the head. But even like with a certain group of people that grew up on like that TRL stuff mm-hmm. and they see like the NSYNC's Backstreet Boys, Britney, Christy, like that was... <laughs> all of my faves she's like that's my era <laughs> right exactly like there's never been a story of success where it's completely isolated unless you're like the Macarena guys unless you're one hit wonder or you just shut down your category which is like Weird Al but yeah. you know we were trying to do it in the beginning just by ourselves with no click with no family and that sort of thing and then starting right after we we kind of knew like Illadolf Half-Life would be like the quote sacrificial lamb. Mm-hmm. So we just said, look, let's just make the most critically acclaimed album that we can. And then <laughs> next album, we're going to start planting the seeds for our family. And then right. it, it wound up happening, you know? So that, that's what I tell people all the time when they ask me like, you know, what should you, what should you do? Like, do you have any advice? And the first thing I do is like birds of a feather, like find yeah. your, find your family, find, find your, your tribe. starting five, find your tribe. Yes. Um, as yes. I, I love the the confidence and the visionary nature of saying, so we just decided we were going to make the most critically acclaimed album that we could make. <laughs> that's, that's very forward thinking. Um, <laughs> uh, recipes to Rich Nichols. He, he um, for those jam sessions, Black Lily and the Wetlands things uh, helped me as an artist tremendously and gave me a click. I became part of that clique. I became associated with those artists. Mm-hmm. And through those associations, my career was started. Um, when Rick, Rich Nichols, I came to him so, for some advice when I was having a sort of management crisis and trying to decide where I should go. Mm-hmm. And the advice that he gave me was priceless. And Rich Nichols always made himself available to me as a friend and someone who I could get advice from. And his uh, going home service in Philadelphia at that theater you guys put on sort of a performance mm-hmm. play musical thing. That was the most beautiful going home service I had ever seen in my life. So I definitely want to shout out the Roots crew and the Roots family um, and the family of Rich Nichols. He's so Thank important. you, man. Thank you. Um, when you came to New York, I heard about you. Okay, so I had Do You Want More on a cassette before it came mm-hmm. out. And Do You Want More was the first album that was officially released that I had a copy of before released. So I felt like a music mm-hmm. industry insider. And it was because I was hanging out with people like this. Oh, like Salt. you had something that <laughs> Yeah. I had the the pre whatever, the 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 pre copy, whatever. So hanging out with Beef Sausage, Gene right. Gray, my man Ocean from New York. Uh yeah. you know, Jay Ruder Damager was around. These were sort of your early tour guides uh in New York City. Shout out to all of mm-hmm. them. Do you remember any of the places or things that they put you onto? Okay, I have to sort of preface it a little bit with what got us to that point. And what got us to that point was the fact that, um, in a nutshell, uh, the summer before in 1992, um, after being a group in name only for seven years, Tariq and I decided, okay, this is a do-or-die moment. Either he's going to go to college and I'm going to try to go to Juilliard. Like, we might not be a group no more. Mm. I was on my way to a Juilliard audition and Tariq rolled with me and on the train ride, uh, 
back to my friend's apartment, a girl had approached us and asked me if I was the um, the bucket drummer in this new Spike Lee commercial. Spike Lee had did a, 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 a Levi's commercial mm-hmm. with a drummer named Chocolate, who was like one of the first public busking bucket drummers mm-hmm. in New York City. At the time, I was rocking my hair sort of like this, and I had quasi notoriety because my high school mates, Boys to Men, had put me in the Motown Philly video. Right. So I think at the time, it was sort of like, hashtag all look same <laughs> I just like even though I was like no that's not me um you know it sort of stuck with us and you know on the way home we were telling our friends like yeah girls the girls is thinking Amir was the, the drum and the Levi's commercial like you know we we got home we got home that Friday night he crashed on the couch and then the next morning when we're watching Soul Train uh that commercial comes on that was our that was our Doc Brown flex capacitor realization eureka light moment that was like i get, I get that reference other, so like yes <laughs> it, it, it just hit us like eureka like <laughs> wait a minute why don't we do that for real he rushed out my house i lived in west philly he ran to south philly he's like all right in three hours we're gonna meet at south street uh he got his buckets uh i had you know his grandmom had like an old bucket. I had some old pots and pans. I snuck out the house. Um, and we only did 25 minutes on South Street, but we made about $100, which wow. was like super. Like in our mind, it's like, yo, we could we could take some joints to the movies, you know, have a picnic. Like for us, this was like date night money. That was the first and Roots picnic. Yeah, Yo, literally <laughs> the first Roots picnic. And uh, we split the 50 bucks and we're like, yo, we're on to something. Let's do this again. That's essentially where the roots were born. So that entire summer, we busked on South Street. And in doing that, we would also get gigs that your average rap group wouldn't get. There's a j- legendary jazz bassist in Philly, Jamal Adin Takuma. He hears about this group that's been having buzz for the last six months. He says, hey, I'm doing a tour of Germany. I'm doing these things called music festivals. Mm-hmm. Um, I have enough budget to take all of you guys with me. Would you like to do so? We're like, hell yeah. And subsequently, we use the buzz of that one show to to somehow finagle our way into um, uh, a bidding war with about eight labels. So mm-hmm. all of 1993, we're in this bidding war. Mm-hmm. It was a Hail Mary throw. Like we were set to go to Mercury on a Thursday and wound up on Geffen Records five days later. The day that Kurt Cobain committed suicide was a panic day for us because we figured that Geffen might pull the plug now that their marquee artist is no longer making the money. Right. So uh, Richard Nichols figured out a way for us to, in that sort of Whoopi Goldberg ghost, go to the bank, shut our account down in disguise, like put your suits on and Yes, we like to close the account. We were controlling our budget. They didn't have a staff at Geffen. So they trusted us with the budget. Just give us receipts. We trust you guys. Like that's wow. how much money was flowing back then. So we took our money and we literally um we exiled to London, lived there for a year. And then Do You Want More came out. Now leading to what you asked me about about like you know, what was it like in the beginning? Yeah, like in the in the beginning, um, Tariq had made friends with J. Rue the Damager, Mad Early, like in kind of the, the gangstar clique. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of like his clique. And I had uh, made friends with um, the Natural Resources clique, or even before they were called Natural Resources. Right. Um, and Ocean from Natural Resources, like, took a liking to us and was always hanging around, so... He was my introduction to New York City. And I remember the first day of like, it was it was Christmas of 1993. And I remember all of them experiencing what 42nd Street was for the very first time that it was under its Disney Mm. sort of makeup. Disney vacation of a, yeah. Right. So, you know, me being a foreigner in this place, you know, I was all like, wow, this is nice. This is cool. And they were all like very dismayed, like, no, you don't understand. Like forty second street, the allure of forty second street right. is over now. Like where are the pimps, where are the prostitutes? Used to be, 
Where the drugs? Right. Like they're trying to explain <laughs> to me that this this Starbucks is now used to be a a, a porno house and this right. is where like a red light district was and now mm. it's you know like you know KB Toy Store or Toys R Us like mm. I, I didn't realize that my first day my first week in New York was like the unveiling of Disneyfied New York mm. City so you know I I had all of these like this what what you guys would call bridge and tunnel uh, <laughs> that's sparkles exactly right. And ro- <laughs> rose colored glasses in my eyes, like, wow, guys, this is really neat. You know, that sort of thing. And they were, they were rather mournful that the New York they knew was, was, was trickling away. So, right. Yeah. I mean, that was from like December to April, just recording the record at Battery Studios um, with Bob Power and legendary engineer. meeting the cast of characters. Yes. Did you did you want to work with Bob Power because specifically because of Tropical Quest and De La? We just made a listing of the best sounding records that we ever heard. And it just so happens that, you know, the way that the De La albums were engineered, the, the way that the, the Tribe albums were engineered, um that was that was Bob Power. Yeah, it was just a it was a it was a loudness and a crispiness of it. The only person since then that has matched those sonics was Dr. Dre. Like, Dr. Dre was mixing his records because he wanted his albums to be just as sonically strong as what was on radio. Mm -hmm. And somehow Bob Power managed to figure out how to make drums aggressively in your face and your vocals aggressively in your face without compromising the mix. Bob Power's job before... uh, making some of the greatest hip hop records of all time was he was the, he was the music jingle guy. So like he made commercials, that's how he paid his bills. And uh, the, the, the head engineer of Calliope just wanted to take a week off um, really because he kind of dreaded like uh, the rap guys are coming. Like Mm -hmm. you give it to Bob. He likes the rap guys. And I think it was like a jungle brothers record. And then after that, Bob never left. Like his life changed, and he became the go-to guy. So that's dope. Yeah, working with Bob Power on on our first seven records. Yeah, that's dope. Now you went on yep. tour when as a as a child. My children have toured with me, and so now they're uh, musicians. Um, can you describe what it's like having the different experience of being on tour with musicians at such a young age? At the, at the beginning of the 70s, my dad was having his uh, nostalgia comeback period. So his his initial his initial spark was somewhere between 1956 and 1961. Dick Clark would throw these shows at Radio City Music Hall, at Madison Square Garden, you know, just like a lot of like uh, Eastern and some places on the West. These are... Uh, extravaganza shows where it'd be like, uh, you know, 10 acts, Harvey and the Moon Glows, Jackie Wilson, Raparena and the Del Runs, and Lee Andrews and the Heart. So that's where I initially, that's where I grew up backstage in that environment. Um, as far as that first ways was concerned, I don't remember much. I do remember my dad introducing me to, to a legendary drummer, Bernard Purdy. Okay. Who's on many a breakbeat. And... My dad brings over Purdy and says, like, Purdy, tell my son how you keep food on the table. And Purdy looks at me and says, the two and the four. Wow. And then walks away. Wow. And I'm like, I'm three years old. I don't get that means. But he was sort of planting the seeds in my mind, like, to be straight as an arrow, like, to always keep the pocket. Dad was more or less relying on his cachet in the oldies doo-wop world, and he would just make a kick-ass lounge show. So, whereas you and I will DJ mm-hmm. at clubs like, oh, where are you going tonight, Qua? Oh, I got a DJ gig in Connecticut somewhere right. or that sort of thing. Um, back then, the DJ gig was, you know, you your band performed at this particular stab- establishment and did a residency. So my dad, from like 74 to 84, he's doing six months at this uh, resort in Puerto Rico or doing four months at the Tropicana in Lake City or doing the Catskills. And so my first job was GPS. Uh, whenever we get lost and we have to ask the gas station guy, like, hey, how do you get to 
blah, blah, blah club. And mm-hmm. I would have to write down what he said. Okay, make a right on the light. And da, 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 da. So I was GPS from like, from five till about seven. <laughs> and wow. then I got up, I got upgraded to wardrobe. So I had to learn how to iron. I had to learn how to steam. I had to learn how to clean leather. I had to learn <laughs> to shine his rings. I had to buff his shoes. I had to go to the cleaner. So I was on wardrobe duty. I'll say from 10 to 12, uh, I was quasi production manager. So so by the age of 10, I knew how to do sound uh, and and operate the spotlight. So it's quite a I'm skill set. 11 years old. Literally, yeah, I'm doing like all of his lights. And then finally, it all came full circle. There was a show at Radio City Music Hall where, uh, this is 83. So I was 12 and my dad's drummer got a motorcycle accident and his right arm didn't work. Normally that's a cause for panic to find out that your drummer uh, is out of commission at a Radio City Music Hall gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just like, he looks at me and was like, all right, well, someone take him to Macy's to get a, a suit jacket. You're the band leader. Mm. And I'm 12 years old, getting on the drum set for the first time. And he was just like, with confidence, like, all right, you know what you're doing. You know the show better than anyone else. Right. You're the drummer. So, yeah, I started at 12 at Radio City, and I ended at 23 mm-hmm. at Madison Square Garden. And wow. so that that was basically my life. I mean, I when it was time for school, I'd stay at my grandmother's house and they get a sub drummer. But for the most wow. part, um, I got conned into the family business. That's a beautiful <laughs> life. It's a beautiful life. Um, now, you mentioned the jam sessions and how important they were to the Roots identity. Um, you told me a story of the first jam session and Prince came through to the first jam, jam session. Now, I've also read mm-hmm. an interview where you said that uh, with all due respect to your father and your parents, uh, when it comes to music, Don Cornelius is the father, Prince is the son, and Michael Jackson is the Holy Ghost. Um, you watch Soul Train mm-hmm. a lot. Um, can you right. break down why these things, these three primary influences were so important? Probably the most important thing you got to know about me is that I grew up in uh, a three passionate record collector household. My, my dad was really big on harmonies. Mm-hmm. You know, like harmonies. And so he liked a very specific type of easy listening vocalist, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. My mom, on the other hand, she would have been she would have been down with us. She was a, she was like a crate digger without knowing it. OK, so she she chose her records based on like. She chose her records based on on how funky the album covers looked. Mm-hmm. If Marty Clairwick did it, then she purchased that record. And usually it's like abstract funk and soul. So she was like more like, she was a crate digger. And then my sister, you know, she's bringing home like uh, Changes by David Bowie. She's <laughs> she's <laughs> bringing home Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Mm-hmm. So I grew up with three very distinct record collectors uh, in, an out, in a house that had over 5,000 records. And most importantly... Um, I lived in a don't touch my stereo household. <laughs> so thus, I was held hostage by, yeah, if it was up to me, I'd listen to Ernie and Bert and, you know, the records I want to listen to. <laughs> right. But I had to listen to all their music and take it in. I couldn't touch the stereo ever. That's number one. Number two, um, they were not big on me watching television. They would let me watch music shows. But the thing is, is that most music shows were syndicated and depends on where you live in America. You don't know what time these shows are coming on. Mm-hmm. In my particular case, like every the rest of America has a relationship with Soul Train in which that's a 12 o'clock in the afternoon experience on a Saturday. Soul Train used to come on at one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday after Saturday Night Live. But my parents were still cool and still liberal in the 70s, so we had an agreement. They'd wake me up at uh, at 12.45, so I would always wake up to the second song of whoever the music guest was on Saturday Night Live, okay. watch the last 15 minutes of SNL, and then Soul Train comes on from 1 to 2 in the morning, and that's my TV for the week. And 
that's why I guess my obsession with it is because that was the television show I was allowed to watch. Right. So a lot of my memories, I have photo, photo, uh, graphic memories based on Soul Train episodes. For every episode that comes on, I know exactly where I was. I know exactly what happened. So would you say your parents were the uh, cause for you wanting to have your encyclopedic knowledge of music because that was just your environment? Well, I mean, again, it's like, I don't... I think they just provided... uh, They provided a a purposeful path that led me to that. Because, again, I don't know if on my own accord... I would have found it interesting. I mean, some stuff I was kicking and screaming with. There's a period where a lot of America, like 80, 81 was such a a cultural change for America. And so there was a period where like, um, this kind of weird Christian messaging occurred and everyone fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, including mm-hmm. my parents. So... They were less cool and less like liberated artsy, and then they just became super. Com- like we turned into like the black version of uh, 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 the next door neighbors on The Simpsons. Um, why am I giving all these cartoon life references? Uh, <laughs> the Flanders, uh, like the Flanders. Yeah, yeah, the Flanders. Like we became like the black Flanders. So suddenly, like. When Prince enters my life, oh man, like to own a Prince album in my household was like, it was risk and punishment. It was like, (laughs) is it worth buying this record? Mm -hmm. Knowing that it's going to be found five weeks later, like buried under a stack of records or like inside my drums or something. Like (laughs) the the Prince contraband, like the need to exercise me from Prince. No, it was, it was real. It was yeah. like, you know, I've heard other other people who grew, up, uh, grew up in religious households share this similar story. It's very it's a real thing. Well, I hear a lot of fans like with hip hop say the same thing, but for me, like Prince was the earliest hip hop. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that boy's that like there was a there was a pastor in my church uh the week after Michael Jackson's thriller uh debuted on MTV, December second of 1983, whatever that following Sunday was, they did this whole thing about how American uh, American music is corrupting our kids and MTV culture. And they did this whole thing on like, uh, they would backwards mask uh, Led Zeppelin records and you were supposed to hear My Sweet Satan. Right. And uh, in Stairway to Heaven, you heard... Uh, you know, they turned the Prince album upside down and it's like, this is a six, six, this 1999 is a six, six, six and a penis. And, (laughs) you know, a thriller song is about demons and demonic and, you know, and then my mom's looking at me in the pew, like, (laughs) don't you own those records? (laughs) No. (laughs) And that just starts the longest, like the rebellion period the rebellion period of my life and these like they were complete opposite in the early eighties. They just became strictly, you know, it, it, we went through the worst conservative period ever that a black family could go through. So I find it fascinating that, uh, you know, this is, these stories shaped you and, um, you know, everything you're saying has turned you into the person that is to go to for the, any music docu- documentary, if there's a music documentary, it's not real unless Questlove is interviewed for it. Um, but I want to pivot and start talking a little bit about the roots and early days of the roots. Tell me a little mm-hmm. bit about Scott Storch and how he got involved in the roots and why he left the roots. A lot of people don't know that Scott Storch got his start. Was even in the roots. <laughs> was in the roots. Um, okay, so at the time in the summer of eighty, in the summer of ninety two, when we're busking on South Street. Uh huh. Which South Street is sort of like you know what Hate Street is in San Francisco, or what uh, the Village is in um, New York. Like South Street is the cultural epicenter of Philadelphia. So you know we're using that summer to figure out if we have something, if we don't have something. 
And as I said, we do those Saturdays busking on the corners. We make some money there. But it was always like someone walking up and saying, yo, I'm at Temple University. I work with Sonia Sanchez. We want you to do our poetry slam next blah, 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 next Tuesday. And, you know, come do our Kager next Thursday. So we would get our gigs for the week mm-hmm. via those uh, busking periods. So when we get to September... We do our last final busking show before we take an assessment of, is this worth carrying on after the summer? Do we just part ways here and you go to college and I go to college? Or do we still pursue this? Mm -hmm. And the very last gig we did was at a real hood uh, bar in North Philadelphia uh, that was like part strip club, part bar <laughs> called called the Prince's Lounge. And uh-huh. just a really it's it's probably it's probably like our this is our version of like the me, myself and I video. Like mm-hmm. we walk into this place and we look like, you know, the broke version of Arrested Development. Like I'm wearing Oshkosh and Birkenstocks and, you know, like we're in a hood ass place. You know, and I already look like Prince B from PM Dawn. So just expect that type of energy of people looking at us like, who the hell is this? Right. And um, and we get there, and this is the first time that that particular generation is watching a band do, like, break beats live. Right. So it's like, we so won them over. And in winning them over, we got the attention of the guy who was hosting this talent show. His name mm-hmm. is AJ Shine. AJ Shine is Philadelphia's version of Stretch and Bob Beto. Okay. He was at Drexel University. He was our hip hop guy because between 86 and 94, there was a strong resistance to hip hop music uh, and this whole no commercial rap work day, you know, like more music, less rap. (laughs) <laughs> right, 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 right. I, I remember that. Rap is just synonymous with the voice of black people. So <laughs> oh, basically, I, I that's totally what they were saying. About like, that. Yeah, more music, <laughs> less rap. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so AJ Shine was the cure for that. He he had a really dope um, show. And he seen us and was just like, yo, I want to be down. Like, uh, he had some accident settlement money from like a bus accident like three years ago. He was like, I want to take you all to the studio and let's see if we can do a song together, make a 12 inch and that sort of thing. So that's how we started. His partner was Richard Nichols. They were also the local Ralph McDaniels. So while you guys have video music box, Mm -hmm. Philly had a show called The Avenue hosted by AJ Shine um, and filmed by Richard Nichols. And so once they saw us, we figured out, okay, how our words worlds can collide. So at the time, um, Rich was always trying to write like government grants, get government grants for like to have music workshops to keep teach neighborhood kids how to program music, how to make beats, how to use a four track machine. Like he was that type of community person. He was the guy that like your local police athletic league will come in and teach you. This is a microphone. This is a tape recorder. This is a keyboard. And this is how you make music. Mm-hmm. Um, so in doing so. There was a, I don't know how to describe what Scott's life was um, before he really came into ours. I mean, he he wasn't an orphan. I, I mean, I will say that he came from, he, he, you know, that, that person in your life that has a privileged background, but they kind of disown it in a genuine way, not in that sort of hipster way where it's like, I'm going to wear this dingy ass shirt and make you think. Mm -hmm. I'm poor, but my parents, I'm really a trust fund kid. Mm -hmm. Like he, he had a nurturing household and well able parents, but he was just always, he was always sleeping on like Rich's floor and Rich's couch. And so the thing about Scott was that Scott was just a walking jukebox. Okay. Scott knew every Stevie Wonder song, every, like the way that I knew breakbeats, Scott knew You know, this Herbie Hancock line that, you know, that sort of thing. Um, So we had always heard about Scott Storch. But I mean, besides just the novelty of like, hey, Scott, play up between the sheets by the Osley brothers. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, he just play it. But 
he wasn't making music. So I'll say that um, when we, f- the first night that we came in to make our very first song, which was Pass the Popcorn, uh, that's on Organics, mm-hmm. um, the first thing that they recognized was that, oh, we do, the Roots record music fast. Like the average rap song takes, I mean, you've made songs before. Mm-hmm. It, it might take you four to six hours to make a song. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I got to lay the beat down first. You got to write to the... You know, and we did it in like 45 minutes. So then it was like, well, let's do another song. So by the end of the weekend, we had like eight songs already that were good. And then I guess at the end of the session of that three-day period of us just being in the studio, getting all these songs out, Scott came to visit and he just started to play. And I think the very first song that we did was together was the roots is coming ironically the last song for the for the organics period was scott storch's first song like and it just fit well and we're just like hey you want to be down so he was with us forever um i think towards the end of do you want more towards the end of do you want more once we realize that we're going to have to live on the road. Like, this is not going to be as easy as we thought it was going to be. Like, we thought, like, oh, when something new comes out, it's going to blow up, and we're going to blow up, and this is going to be amazing, and people are going to embrace us. And then when that didn't happen, then it was like, oh, plan B, what do we do? And our first thing was like, well, let's run away to Europe. Scott had cultivated a, 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 a working relationship and a friendship with Joe Nicolo, of Studio Four, okay. Uh, the same Joe Nicolo at the end of Jump Around. This is right, dedicated right, right. to Joe. Right. The fire. That, Jump Around yeah. was a diss song about Joe Nicolo. That's what we found out when we interviewed Everlast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yo, you you gonna release a Jump song after we tell right. the Jump song? <laughs> right. And so uh, I was I was actually an intern at Rough House Records in the daytime doing this. So I would intern at Rough House, send in uh, all these uh, crisscross posters to whatever, wherever Michael Jackson's Dangerous Tour was in Europe. You know, they were his opening act. So it was my job to make sure that Chris Cross had enough posters and swag <laughs> for whatever town they were with uh, Michael Jackson. So um, by the end of Do You Want More?, uh, which is uh, the recording of it, like April of '94. You know, Scott just said, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to tour. I want to do more studio stuff. So, wow, Hot Tech said he, the same thing to me. Yeah, I never. It's 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 weird because, and, and the same could be said for Dilla. Like Dilla didn't do a lot of those early Slum Village dates. He didn't do the OK Player tour with us, right? And so, you know, I think because i mean now life is easier where you could take your studio with you but back yeah. then you had to be in one stationary place to work on music and that sort of thing so right you had to be in the, the kitchen time, to cook right so at the time billy joel was working on his very last record the record with like in the middle of the night uh whatever you released in 1993 mm-hmm. and joe nicolo was a part of the production on that record and scott storch was you know in proximity. So he just, Scott just stayed a root uh, in studio only. The same way with James Poyser. I mean, technically, James Poyser joined the Roots in 96. Right. But he was just the second keyboard player, you know, and it took James like 20 years to finally like officially be a root. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the same thing. Like, so that's how Scott, and he, you know, anytime we were in the scoot- studio, he was just there to, to assist and 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 write songs with us. The Roots have a song called "Double Trouble" featuring a uh, Black Thought and Most Def, uh, which would make it double and not triple. And uh, I recorded on this song. And when the Roots album came out, I wasn't on it, <laughs> but I was thanked in the credits for recording it. And then the Roots put me on two songs on the next record, and I appreciate. The Roots right. for doing that. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, even with Double Trouble, when I came to hear what Most had done, you were the first verse I heard. And uh-huh. I same situation. And I was like, yo, Rich, which one of Tariq's boys is this? And <laughs> Tariq was like, I don't know who that is. Who's that? <laughs> like, it, 
it was literally like, wait a minute, the hell? So now I got to find that real, like, I, I worked like on Things Fall Apart 20. Yeah, right. like, soon as, as soon as COVID is over, then I can try to find that real to see, you know, what, what, what the, I got it, we got to do a triple, triple, uh, triple trouble, trouble version of double trouble. <laughs> so you are, right. you and are, so, you told me that Wendy Goldstein, um, was it sort of involved? She was the label person at MCA at the time, right? Um, mm-hmm. when, when I think about Double Trouble, when I think about how that possibly happened, because until you told me that the other day, I wasn't aware that y'all just didn't know who I was. And I think what happened was MCA was trying to court Most Def and they were trying to get Most Def to sign Black Star to MCA. And so Wendy, it was right. Wendy's idea to be like, I think y'all probably asked for Most Def and Wendy was like, they want Black Star and had me show up at the studio. I think that's probably how it happened. Which is weird because, you know, it's weird. The weirdest thing of all is I learned backwards long after the fact, and I mean long after the fact of mixing that song, Mm -hmm. I realized that you were on it. And still to this day, 2000 Seasons is my all-time favorite joint. Oh, thank you. Ever. And then I realized, yo, (laughs) <laughs> we had 2,000 seasons, dude, on that shit. <laughs> like, even before I knew what a Talib Kweli was, right. I I realized long after the fact, like, I mean, by this point, the album was mastered. Right. But then I realized, oh, shit, we could have had him <laughs> on this. Because I loved, by that point, like, Rich Medina was my guru mm. in I non-commercial hip-hop that I should be a born. Yeah. So I would dude. always go to Footwork, and he just gave me a whole pile of records I need mm. to be on. And he gave me 2,000 seasons, and then I realized, ah, that was so, him. So. Do you remember when um, The Roots graciously in 1988, 1998, when Black Star dropped, were going on a tour and asked Black Star to go on a tour? And I was like, I'm about to tour with the legendary Roots crew. And Yasin Bey Most Def had taken his pilgrimage to Mecca shortly after the Black Star album dropped. So when he came back from Mecca, he was like, Kwali, I'm not performing no place where they serve alcohol. Alcohol. I'm like, like, we got we on tour with the roots. Right? We on tour with the roots. And so you were trying to get the venues to stop serving alcohol while Yasin was performing. And that didn't work. So we just didn't go on a tour, right? So that tour traveled the country, came back to New York to Irving Plaza. So I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go see the roots at Irving Plaza. I get to the show, I'm watching the show. Yasin Bey gets on stage and raps. So I'm like, I thought you wasn't rapping and plays to serve alcohol. And then what he did was he, <laughs> he was so happy about his performance that night, he jumped on the tour bus and, and rode the rest of the tour with y'all for free. So we didn't get paid to tour, but he toured for y'all with y'all for free without me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what? I, I wish part of me is jealous that and I'm learning to have that type of freedom. Mm-hmm. Like, because, I mean, it's easy to be judgmental. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I, I always live, you know, my, my dad was very, very drill sergeant Joe Jackson-y. Like, mm-hmm. discipline and da 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 and, you know, the responsibility mm-hmm. and all those things. So, you know, I've always been teased that I've been, like, the hall monitor of music. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm hashtag, well, actually, mm-hmm. I'm hashtag, like, ah, 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 like that sort right. of thing. And, you know, sometimes, man, I just wish, I wish I didn't just, I I wish I didn't squander the first half of my life in a way that I didn't go with my gut Mm -hmm. and go with my freedom or have just have the option or the luxury to to do those things, Mm -hmm. you know, because what's weird is that it's, it still has served him well. In a way, like that, that is a total most move. Mm-hmm. Like I'm gonna go to to I'm gonna go to Mecca and come back and have, you know, like that revelation or whatever. But no, right. I totally remember that. I just remember I'm like, wait, you're just gonna stay on the tour bus with me? Like <laughs> in my mind, I was like, wait, shouldn't you ask your parents first? Or like, <laughs> right, not, right, right. not even like, like right. I just never understood that type of freedom in which like. That can happen. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I love that error Yasin Bey because he was he was grappling with I'm a faithful person. I have this Muslim faith, but also I'm this charismatic, you know, rock star, for lack of a better word. And um he was, you know, he was figuring it out. 
Um, now, the Soulquarians crew is something that people mm -hmm. romanticize. People people look back to that picture, that photo shoot we did with Vibe Magazine, and say, man, why can't people be like that more? Now, the Soulquarians crew was started, the core of it, in my mind, was right. you, uh, Pino Palladino, James Poyser, working with D'Angelo on the Voodoo album, and Electric Lady. Um, talk to me a mm -hmm. little bit about those sessions and how you came up with the term Debonics to describe D'Angelo's singing style. <laughs> Um, what's weird is, you know, the, the person that actually put two and two together was Dilla. Okay. Cause when Dilla found out that him and D'Angelo were born the same month mm -hmm. and then, uh, Jeff Lee Johnson was also in the studio and he's like, wait a minute, you're an Aquarian too? And we're like, oh shit, we're all Aquarians. Like it was just, it was one point right. in which everyone in the, all the creators in the room were Aquarians. Mm -hmm. And then I remember coining that term. Um, then I, I will say that for me, the first day of the seed planting of that movement was uh, the very last day of Philadelphia Half-Life. The very last song we worked on was The Hypnotic. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Hypnotic on Philadelphia Half-Life had its origins as a far side B-side called Emerald Butterfly mm -hmm. that I love so much I would stalk S Slim Kid Trey on the sample for that song. It was the most spacey, beautiful song I ever heard. And at the time, the Jazzy Fat Nasties were living in our compound um, mm -hmm. So the Jassy Fat Nasties, of which Mercedes uh, Mercedes uh, Martinez was the sister of Jay Swift, producer of The Far Side. So during that period of Philadelphia Half Life, like they were playing us like outtakes of Far Side songs and the stuff mm -hmm. that Jay Swift was working on for them. And um, when I heard Emerald Butterfly, like we would drive home from the studio at like five in the morning, right at the crack of dawn. So it's like the sky looks a certain way. You know, like the, the morning looks right before. Mm -hmm. And the, the music background to this particular song was just matching that drive home. And I was like, man, mm -hmm. this song is so wasted as a B-side. I mm -hmm. got to get my hands on the song. So Slim Kid Trey sent me uh, the, the real, uh, a, a dub of the reels of Emerald Butterfly. Mm -hmm. And um, we... Uh, sort of took it apart, put it together, and um, after meeting D'Angelo, uh, this is April of, of 1996. We're on mm -hmm. tour with the Fugees and Soul Train Awards weekend, mm -hmm. and it is April 1st. So Erica Badu and D'Angelo are just meeting for the first time, and they okay. recorded a song for a high school high soundtrack. That was a great oh, soundtrack. Heaven sent you. Yo, great soundtrack, Ter bad terrible movie. movie. But terrible movie. Oh. <laughs> but, but the soundtrack like the was movie. strong, right? <laughs> I like the movie too. Uh, so at the time, I thought that was his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, like he came in and she... By, by Kedar Massenburg. By Kedar Massenburg. Yeah. And so she had this gigantic head wrap on. So I could see their silhouettes based on where they sat in the House of Blues and... You've been to the House of Blues plenty of times in mm -hmm. L.A. to know that, like, in that balcony at the very top, like, sometimes the spotlight would shine on your head. Mm -hmm. So you could see the silhouette of whoever was at the middle table there. And I thought to myself, okay, now's your chance to plan a movement. Okay. Let's, let's, let's go back a year before that. It's, it's during those Do You Want More mixing sessions with Bob Power. Mm -hmm. He's trying to convince me that this guy, Mike Archer, known as D'Angelo, is going to be the second coming of Christ for soul. And D walks in the studio to pick up a, 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 of a mix of It's All Right, because Bob Power is subsequently co-producing Brown Sugar as mm -hmm. he's working on us. And um, D comes in, and I look at his chuckers, I look at his Timberlands, and they're mad raggedy. <laughs> and I judged him. I was like, nah, man, your, your chucks aren't even fresh. Like, 
you know what I mean? Like, I don't know right. why I judged him, but I looked at his shoes mm-hmm. and I was just like, nah, he cool. I mean, I, I mean, I feel that because when I was working at Akira Books, that was a technique I would use. People would walk in and I would look at their shoes and by their shoes, I could tell what book I would give them. So if their shoes was like <laughs> fucked up, <laughs> like if their shoes was like real bad, I would tell them to the history, history section. Power. Yeah, it's history section. If they had like high heels, I would sell them like a Connie Briscoe or Baby Moore Campbell novel or something. Because well, I was people judging with by dirty shoes. shoes like history, huh? That's right. They're, teachers, <laughs> shoes be dirty and fucked up. They don't they care. They don't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I remember dismissing him. And um, I know that Bob wanted me to play on Shit Damn Motherfucker. Mm-hmm. And I think at the time... Uh, did both of you... I, it, was, it, was, it was a rare date night for me. So it was mm-hmm. either... <laughs> date this girl I was trying to get with or play on R&B dude's record and <laughs> I chose the girl well, which is weird which is even weirder because um, I later found out that Ron Carter was supposed to play bass on Shit Damn Motherfucker but because of its title mm-hmm. he instantly, he was like hell no I'm not playing on a song called Shit Damn Motherfucker <laughs> so, the ses- so the session got cancelled but I remember dismissing D'Angelo mm-hmm. And I only discovered him. I, I was at the Source Awards uh, the second year that I call Hip Hop's Funeral. 95. And when, yeah, so right at that moment where Snoop is like, let it be known then. East Coast ain't got love for Dr. J and Snoop Dogg. Right. He's like, Look, we know where we at. We know. Like me and my right. date are running out of Madison Square Garden. Like our life depends on it. Like right. you heard, you an explosion could have, like, I felt like a terrorist act was about to happen. That's how, that's how dangerous the the room was at the time. Mm. So I grabbed her, and, and when I'm running out, somebody from E and I put a cassette in my hand, and I took it, and it was D'Angelo Brown Sugar. Mm-hmm. And initially with tapes, I was just like, all right, whatever, right? But I was like, all right, let me check this shit out. And so I'm listening, and I hear it. And I realize, oh, this is the Bob Power guy. This R&B dude with the shoes. Right. And I was like, wait a minute. Somebody's singing over music that like a Tribe Called Quest could make. Mm-hmm. And I was like, at that point, I heard that record and I was like, oh, I fucked up. Mm. This guy's the, this guy's the second coming. Mm. And I need to be down with this dude. So I had to figure out how to get back in his good graces. Like once I realized I fucked up, I knew I had a year to get it together before he settled on someone that was going to be his person. And so um, when I saw his silhouette in the audience at the House of Blues, I said, all right, I'm going to send you a message. And so the, the drunken Dilla style that, I adapted in my drumming, like playing like Dilla live, Mm -hmm. that messed up sort of thing. I, I yet to try it on the roots. Like I practice on my own, but I, I didn't, I didn't know any musicians that were Mm -hmm. capable enough to still keep it steady while I played fucked up. Right. And I was like, I gotta let this guy know I speak his language. Mm -hmm. So I threw off the show that day on a way that, you know, the band was sort of looking at me like, why are you playing real fucked up right now? Mm -hmm. So like the beginning of my trademark style where I, you know, play behind the beat and that sort of Dilla-esque drunken drum programming type of beat playing. I did it that night and I saw instantly when I did it, I saw in his... I saw on his head, like you just saw this the whole time, like the the silhouette of his head bouncing in the audience. And I was like, yeah, motherfucker, I got you now. I got you now. And the more I did with the drums, I was like, yeah, I got you. I got you. And literally at the end of the show, like we didn't even speak words. He just like, yo, you're my brother. Like Mm. we're from the same tribe. Like, and he told Bahamadia, like, yo, you're... So cut to three weeks later, he comes to Philly to sing the hypnotic. Um, 
And there was time left over, seven hours left over. So we just set the keyboards up. I got on drums and we just jammed for like three hours. Mm. Um, subsequently, Erica was also starting the her uh, other side of the game sessions with us mm. the next day. D'Angelo stayed and we had a jam session with Erica, D'Angelo and members, me and James Poyser. And the roots, and two weeks later, he invited me to Battery Studios to start working on a song with him. Um, he didn't like the vibe of Battery, so then we moved to Electric Lady, and that's the beginning of a four year residency of just like it was college. And it was yeah. literally from, nine, from 96 to 2000. At least for his portion, because even then, like, we stayed there, passed there. I'll say from 96 to 2003, like, that became our home. You included. Like, that yeah, was, was that was, that was, that was our space station. And yeah, some of the best stories of my life, some of the best pranks. Yo, you told a story about Gil Scott Heron going <laughs> yeah. to sleep during, I have a similar story with George Clinton that I never told the world. Um, hear it. George Clinton mm-hmm. says, say, uh, uh, we allowed to smoke here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were like, yeah, yeah you can do what you know, do what you want. Uh, George Clinton was visiting. I don't know if he was visiting D or maybe it was com- like, I don't. George Clinton was there. And um, <laughs> he said, yeah, but, uh, you know, I, let me let me get a private room, you know, just, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, <laughs> like a big giant wink. Now, so we let him in the live room of A, and inside mm-hmm. of the live room of A, there's a secluded drum booth uh, with no air inside that George Clinton's being led to. And um, three hours go by, and it's like we forgot that George Clinton <laughs> was still in that room. What a life. <laughs> and um, so I go to that room, <laughs> And I open the door and the amount of smoke and the smell that I've never smelled in my life. Mm. And it was one of those things where it's like I inhaled the shit out of it. And then I think I let it placebo in my mind that I just inhaled some smoke substances that I never thought (laughs) I'd do in this lifetime. Three to one contact. (laughs) Instantly in my head, I'm like, Oh no, I'm an addict. I'm an addict. I'm an addict. I'm an addict. <laughs> and I got inside my head. So I ran upstairs. I ran upstairs. And I was like, all right, uh, uh, air, that'll do the trick. So I'm like, <sighs> so I'm on 6th and 8th Avenue, like taking these deep breaths, like, okay, I'm not, I don't have that smoke. I don't have this. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll get wheatgrass. So you remember that Essence store, that like health food store is right next to Fat Beats? I ran there. I was like, I need a pint of wheatgrass and the woman's looking at me like no we only do these little shots like i said give me a pint he's like that's going to be like a hundred and something dollars give it to me and then (laughs) i figured if i took a pint of wheatgrass i (laughs) eradicated out of my body get rid of it and i was like no uh i might be still high so let me just walk and i just start walking it's there's a there's a there's a comedy bit of dave when he said he first tried mushrooms and he took a jog around the block. He's like, it was it was eleven fourteen, and I decided to take a jog around the block. Mm. And I ran around the block three times. And then I took a nap, listened to every CD I ever had. And I woke up, and it was eleven thirty. It was eleven thirteen, like two minutes later. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was same thing. Next thing I knew, I was on like thirty fourth Street in front of Macy's. Like that's how fast I was walking, thinking, "Wow, I'm high." And I'm and an a, addict. A, elect, electric Lady is on West 8th Street, just for context for people. Yes, so on a, West 8th least... and 6th Avenue. So I, I walked like 30 <laughs> damn near blocks right, to right. Some, some sort of panic-stricken thing. And I finally talked myself off the ledge that you're not high. Right. Just go back to the studio. And right. No, but like crazy stuff like that was happening all the time. Uh, Malik B is a fantastic MC. And I feel yeah. like especially in those early years, he was pushing. Black Thought is seen, in my estimation, as 
but he's my favorite MC most of the time, and he's seen as one of the best MCs to ever do it, but I feel like Malik was really pushing him. But can you share with us a little bit about what happened with Malik and where, where's Malik at now? Just in his particular case, um, the, the, the cultural change that we were going through at the time like, we literally just went to London on a whim. Kurt Cobain's dead. Oh, God, we're fucked. We got to get out here and save our careers. We're going to go to London. And then we go to London, and you're alone. And, you know, it was, it was, it was you know, you didn't know where your next meal was coming from. We lived off of fish and chips until uh-huh. the cows came home. Like, there's a lot. And I think just at the end... um, he just he just snapped one day and it was just mm-hmm. like I I need to be home around people I know and you know we we decided to 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 go out there and do the longest version of like Homer the Iliad. We had to go okay. to another place in another part of the world just to mm-hmm. and live there for four years alone without our families, without anything, and come back, you know, four years later, which I mean he wasn't built for that. So I mean, he's like for me. It's like Tariq is Tariq is the 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 esoteric genius of of the wordsmith of the group. But Malik is such a deep. And when I say terra firma, terra firma is sort of like a a term that you use for when you say down to earth. Like yeah, Malik Malik drops mad jewels yeah. in all of his rhymes, and so that kind of juxtaposition. Between those two, like I felt like was a, a perfect marriage. So, um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. First time I spoke on that publicly. Could you explain the story behind "Don't Say Nothing" from Tipping Point, which I would say is one of the <laughs> hardest kidding tracks and reminds us really of how raw roots can be. Um, you know, it's so weird. Like my relationship with the Tipping Point. Is so redheaded stepchild. Um, you know, we made we make this record in in 2004, and the the thing that happens to a lot of us, and I think you were part of this, Quali, was that um, MCA as a label had mm-hmm. had gone under. Yeah, and so there were there were a bunch of free agents at the label. Like practically everyone on MCA was like left to center. Esoteric, you know, it was like most Dill was there. Uh, J- it was Jizza. Uh, Quali was there. Yeah, Jizza, mm. uh, Farrell Munch, like practically all of Rockets Records, like mm. was under MCA's umbrella. So, like, step number one was we all were going to have to have our moment with Jimmy Iovine. And it was going to be like a sink or swim moment. And mm. this is the first time we're dealing with a label. In Los Angeles, as opposed to New York, like it's easier when it's 1755 Broadway, mm-hmm. where you just drive up to the, you know, you're in their faces and you have relationships with the interns and everyone there. But um, suddenly we're in, we're on a label in which like the least selling act does five million units, you know. Yeah. Um, so we find out in late 2003 that the label has folded a week after Electric Circus comes out. So I'm already fucked it up for everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but the thing, but the kind of stench was we worked on this art record with no label. Mm -hmm. And so the way that it kind of was stillborn in in the public space, there was kind of a stench in the air and it was sort of like, uh, this is Amir's fault, (laughs) you know? And really it's just like, we, we got word that the label was folding a month before it did, and Rich was smart enough to get all budgets open for the seed, for break you off, and for the tour support. Wait, real so quick, we um, were... real quick. I don't, I, I, is there is there a version of? Did y'all ever cover "Serve This Royalty" by Cody Chestnut? We made a demo of it, but Cody was like, "Yo, I really keep that song close to the chest." Well, can you like, play me the I'll demo? I'll let you have the seed. Just play it for me. I want yeah, to, that's, that's like my favorite Cody Chestnut song, and I, just to hear your yeah. version of it, I need to hear it. We we have we have a service royalty. Yeah, 
Okay. So the thing is, is that, um, you know, I mean, had had Dudley in common sort of did that same move. They didn't do that move. And they kind of found out the hard way that the label was folding with like a week left. So Electric Circus comes out and then there's no label. Mm. And so it dies. And it's so different sounding that the perception of it was like, oh, Com fell off and tried to make this art record. Mm. And Quest Love ruined it. Um, <laughs> and so. And the crochet pants, too. It's crochet pants. Too. <laughs> yeah, all those things. But yeah, I mean, no, I mean, but, but to keep it in perspective, 10 years later, mm. then suddenly people were like, Oh, this album was ahead of its time. That's and, right. You know, That's like, right. F- fusion all always. Those... People have to catch up to Fusion. Exactly. So we find out that Dr. Dre personally saved us. We were not. Mm-hmm. We were not the the selected two animals to get on Noah's Ark for the first round of who gets saved from MCA. Like Common got in, Mary J. Blige got in. Like very few got in, and they were going to lock up the I, Ark. I, I got in too. Um, I had the, the the I Try record with Mary J. Blige, and that that sort of helped. Even though he wanted Jimmy Iovine wanted Maya on it, but like Mary, me having that record with Mary. Help me with that situation. Yeah, I was about to say you were you were still hot off of the get by fumes, so I feel like you were easy right. shoe in. So you you got in, we didn't get in, which was sort of head scratching because it's like, wait a minute, we made the most unroots album of all time, and it mm-hmm. still went gold. Like mm. there's still something here. So I guess Rich made that argument, and then as an afterthought, Dr. Dre vouched for us and was like. Yeah, say the roots too. So then, mm-hmm. whew, all right. So we get on the arc, um, but the conversation with Jimmy Iovine was just—it was way different than it was back in the days of Wendy Goldstein, where you felt like the person knew you and cared and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. It was just sort of like you know, like he recapped the the the, the talking points, and um, his first thing was like, "Yeah, I didn't like the seed." He's like. <laughs> You know, and we're like, well, what do we do with that? Because that right. worked very well for us. And, right. you know, it's a great record. so we knew instantly the type of energy that we were dealing with. And so this is the first and the last time we ever did this. We were just like, all right, we're going to make an album for Jimmy Iovine. And we'll do whatever he says, because everyone he works with has the magic touch and they all win. So if we don't win, then that's because we didn't listen to him, which mm-hmm. basically meant a lot of Amir's crazy left to center ideas probably won't find a home on this album. So right. they let me, I said, well, look, I said, let me at least get the first 15 minutes of the records. Let me do the intro. Mm-hmm. Like I get star. Let me do all my creative stuff there. Mm-hmm. And then I'll fall in line for the rest of the record. And it's not that I like disassociate or I'm trying to backslide from the tipping point, but it's just like I just remember it was about let's save our let's 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 save our souls, which is weird because we're we're what we're dealing with now in 2020 when we're talking about the the, the sort of the systematic uh, landmine traps and racism that we're dealing with. You know, in this sort of Black Lives Matter uh, era that we're in, you know, there's slowly but surely there are different portals opening up where people are sharing their stories. And I'm just thinking about it. And I'm like, man, like the hoops that we have to jump through as creatives, you know, like I'm sure never once in history did Bob Dylan think like, well, you know, I got to get this hot remix from blah 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 blah, <laughs> right? So that to, I can to, to I can still stay him. relevant, yeah. right? Or you know, jo- Joni Mitchell never had to wear this particular outfit or that sort of thing, and mm-hmm. it's just like you know, a lot of times artists will come up to me. I mean, I've even had Beyonce tell me like, and this is like way before her awakening and her taking her own power. But it's like you know, artists would always say like, man, like sure must be nice, man. Like you guys get to mm. make these art records and do what you want to do, and you can still make a living. And you're not scared of getting dropped like trust me every album i ever made there's always this invisible guillotine hand button that i imagine 
that is going to end our careers like one false move and then we don't have a record deal and then we're we're broke and then we're dead. And so you can't be creative with that type of energy. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. You can't um, be creative with that energy. And so, you know, this is the, I'll say that I wish I could have a redo on the tipping point because we played it so safe on that record. Um, is it is it is it true that that Black Thought for the Don't Say Nothing record had demoed up the hook, and that he was just kind of mumbling through it, and Jimmy Iovine was like, "No, that's the hook. Keep the mumbling." Yes. Now this burnt me the first time around because when we did Distortion Static mm-hmm. with that laughing, and my mind was like, "Yo, every kid in America is gonna be laughing," <laughs> and they're like, "But that's the hook. The hook's just gonna be ah ha ha ah ha 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 ha. Mm-hmm. That's the hook." We're like, yeah, man, it's going to work. It's going to work. And we tried to convince them, <laughs> right. and it didn't work. So I was gun shy. I was gun shy on those types of suggestions. But when I heard it, I was just like, nah, I, I feel like that can work. Yes, at the time, it was just like a workspace thing. But mm. I mean, the same thing happened with Earth, Wind, Fire in September. They were supposed mm. to have actual words in body, uh, blah, 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 body, uh, and they were going to yeah. replace the body uh, with actual with whatever they felt the hook of the song was supposed to be. And it never happened. They were just like, all right, well, leave it by the yacht. And so- all right, the vibes don't lie. Wait, it doesn't say party on? No, by the yacht. Oh my God. And this whole time I've been singing party on. Party, party on. Oh my God. <laughs> that works. That would have been right. a word that would have worked. No, oh ba- body is <laughs> body is the default Badia is the default uh, kind of scat for Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right. Bada ba badia, that sort of thing. And right. they always Ba-da, like ba, 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 we we do that Ba-da, ba, we ba, do ba. that first, and then we'll <laughs> replace the lyrics later. And they never do. And then they're just like, hey, that works. Just leave it badia. So right. in in that particular case, I thought, okay, this is going to work for us. But um, it's it's so weird that. I will say that that's the most compliments that any black person has ever given us for an album. So it's like we made a palatable album Mm -hmm. that was less artsy fartsy that most young black college students come up to me and be like, I love this record. Right. But then a lot of our esoteric kind of post things fall apart. Phrenology Mm -hmm. people were like, why y'all playing so safe? And why does it sound like 50 Cent? You know, I mean, at the time, you know, Scott Storch. Scott I will Scott, tell a story, right. though. The song that you know as Lighters Up by yeah. Little Kim. Little Kim. Mm-hmm. That was the intended first root single. Okay. That's us. That's us. That's that's the roots. Okay. Um, I never the, knew that. The story. I, I DJ, when I DJ, I play that record every set. I, now I see that's why I like That's me playing it. drums. That's, that's me playing drums. That's There's a scene in Do the Right Thing. Where Sam Sam Jackson's given um, he's senior uh, love daddy the uh-huh. neighborhood uh, W L O V E F M I played him on Lasso DJ. I, pl- I played that on Lasso G. I was uh, the the Sam Jackson of the the the, uh, the do the right thing episode of Lasso G. Oh word okay okay so there's a, there's a part in that film where he does roll call right. you know uh, W L O V E where right. you will hear the Jacksons Prince right. Ray Take Charles take six. Da-da-da. Big Daddy Kane. Right. 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 And so the music that you hear in the background, there's a a small drum break there that me and Tariq was like, yo, like we used to always watch Do the Right Thing. And we was like, yo, one of these days we're going to sample that break. So we go to Miami to the Hit Factory to work with Scott Storch. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a particular idea in mind. And... It's finally hit me, yo, I'm going to work on that do the right thing idea mm. now. So then I got a bunch of cymbals. And it's hard to do it because if you there's there's drums on that song, but there's no drums. There's no snare drum on there mm. at all. So I was trying to figure out how can I make a rhythmic song with only hitting the cymbals and the kick drum with no snare. Mm. So I gathered a whole bunch of cymbals and I cheated with a cowbell, you're a cowbell in there. Mm-hmm. So I'm simply just sitting cowbells and cymbals. 
And I start playing that break, and then Scott Storch just starts da 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 da. So we do that. We do it for a good seven minutes. We work mm-hmm. on another song that Freeway took for one of his records. Okay. Of which I was like, all right, I'm gonna do a song with just tom toms and no other drums. Like that. That's the one day I just felt creative where I, like I'm not gonna play traditional drums. I'm gonna try to do something different. And the and next was, thing I knew, the the service guy comes mm-hmm. up to me at the DJ booth and says, yo, I got that new little Kim joint. And he <laughs> hands me the 12-inch. And sight unseen, I'm playing the song. And instantly, like, there'd be some times where I'll hear my drums. Like, I'm really mm-hmm. proud of the fact that I have a signature where you instantly know mm-hmm. it's that type of texture. I didn't know I was on drums because I would have never imagined that I worked on a song that was supposed to be a root song that somehow in two months winds up being a little Kim song without my knowledge mm-hmm. of it. And I'm spinning this song like, yo, this song really feels. And when I heard the thing, I was like, oh, this is like the Sam Jackson do the row. No. <laughs> and then I he changed the piano part up that he initially did with Tariq mm-hmm. to something else. And. That's how I, so Lighters Up was supposed to be, that was supposed to be the Don't Say Nothing song. So, you know, I wow. raised the stinger about it. I got mad as shit. I went to Rich like, yo, man, he gave my Do the Right Thing song to Little Kim. <laughs> and Rich just like, he's cool. He'll he'll give us two. His thing was like, I'll give you two other songs. So he gave us Duck Down and he gave us Don't mm-hmm. Say Nothing. So that's how we actually wound okay. up with those two as a peace offering for First taking your my own. song, you know. That's an incredible story, man. <laughs> Thank um, you. So um, I don't think people really understand how important Dice Raw is to the process of, of writing songs with the roots. And I feel like he really stepped it up. Mm-hmm. You know, he had that like sort of raw, organic, messy freestyle on Do You Want More? But in the era of game theory and rising down, um, and Rising Down was released on the 16th anniversary of the L.A. riots. I feel like Dice Raw stepped it up and the, the records became darker. Um, at that point, uh, well, let me ask you this. Is it hard to be pro-black and subversive while also living in the pop mainstream space? You are one of the most visible hip hop bands for mainstream white America. But then y'all have these sort of subversive pro-black messages in your songs. Um, and then in the way that that Tariq writes and the way that Dice Roar writes. Um, let me know about some of that. I'm from Philadelphia. And even though and here comes the whole survivor's guilt thing again. It's like even though we come from experience where, yeah. yes, we were able to make lives for ourselves. We're still still. You know, we still have to take care of our loved ones. Like everyone has a cousin that they have to bail out of jail. Everyone Mm -hmm. has a boy that just got shot last week. And at the time in Philadelphia, we were dealing with six to 12 murders Mm -hmm. every week. So it's almost Mm -hmm. like the darkness that we feel now. What's unique about it now is that I feel that, you know, the rest of America gets to see the daily the the daily uncertainty that we that that's normal for us right like there's no day that I don't wake up where I don't wake up and walk out the door and I mean not in that way of like it's the day the day I die but it's almost mm-hmm. like you're 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 hyper aware of what safety is and the things that you don't you're not carefree in that most deaf way of like living you know that sort of mm-hmm. thing like I have to premeditate everything so. We wanted to make these records reflecting what Philly was going through. But then on the other side, we kept getting pushback from like, you know, well, yes, you guys are technically skilled, but, you know, you're not as exciting or, you know, or whatever neo minstrel rapper that is entertaining in a sort of a a joker, jester way. And my thing was that, you know, I I think it's important that we have more substance. Like we weren't like I know people like to say like, oh, Roots, like socially conscious hip hop. And that, you know, like we were rhyming for the sake of Ritalin for our first four or five records. Right. And it wasn't until like we were 34 that we realized like, okay, well, 
we can only but do so much throw your hands in the air like you just don't care type shit. But mm-hmm. one day we're going to have to talk about what our lives are like now and right. living in mm-hmm. Philadelphia. And so, you know, it's, it's weird that the collective eye roll that we would get for all these dark records of us dealing with the midlife crisis of where we fit and also just dealing with Philadelphia as a city and and just surviving in general that and the guilt of like but you guys are rich so why do you care mm-hmm. about the plight of black people like mm-hmm. like that was always our version of shut up and gibberish yeah mm-hmm. absolutely like just because we made it you know suddenly like oh we just turn our back on our people and that sort of right. thing and there's you know as far as I'm concerned even now like even with COVID like my daily routine is Take care of my mother. Is she safe? Take care of my sister. Is she safe? Take care of Grace's parents. Are they safe? Take care of that. You know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, worrying about the plight of, of our people that still rings true. And at the end of the day, when all said and done, I want people to hear our music and know what we were about. And this is what we're about. So um, Dice was very, very, very instrumental on... Um, just really, you know, Dice was just very key and instrumental to sort of being a guiding light. Like he went to executive producer role. Right. And, right. and you know, always been there. But yeah, when I first met him, he was just, he was a 13 year old that, that's smoking drank like Red Fox. And right. I just, I never met a 13 year old that, you know, had the mind of a 56 year old. So he freestyled. <laughs> That entire verse on the lesson on Do You Want More? Uh, Do you guys ever sit down and discuss how long you want your Fallon run to be? Or are you just kind of going with the flow until you feel like the spark has run out? Like we literally, like in 2007, we were like, yo, there's any way that we could be in one city with our families. Because it's, you know, it's. I always say that it's one thing where it's one thing if, you know, if if you have kids and you got to go to Melbourne or you got to go to Australia or Asia for like three weeks at a time. It's it's one thing where you have that situation, but it's a whole nother thing in which those kids are now like seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And they're crying at the airport and you feel guilty for mm. leaving. Like so a lot mm. of the roots members that had kids and that sort of stuff, they were just falling apart at the seams at the airports. It was getting unbearable to watch them cry like while we go away for like two months on tour to Europe. So even back in 2007, we were like, if there's any way possible that we could just be in one city and make the same amount of money that we do and still be creative musicians. Mm -hmm. We will take it. And the blessing came in in form of, well, start with the Chappelle show, with being the musical guy at the Chappelle show for season two and three. I got a relationship with Neil Brennan. And when there was word that Leno was going to leave the Tonight Show and that Conan O'Brien was going to go to the Tonight Show and someone was going to take Conan O'Brien's place. They wanted Neil Brennan to direct uh, those late night shows with Jimmy Fallon. At the time, he thought, okay, I'm going to do movies instead of television, but I'll still consult you. And so as an afterthought, when they said, so what what should we do about music? Neil's sentence was, his sentence was, hey, why don't you ask the Roots, ellipsis, they know the best guys that you can use. Mm Mm-hmm. And so Jimmy just took it as, hey, why don't you ask the roots? <laughs> Period. Yeah, nothing else. <laughs> and so cut to uh, I just brought a house in Silver Lake. I just got a crib in Silver Lake. And um, my first day out there, uh, I, th- I believe I saw Jimmy at a red light or something like that. And I don't know how, but. We just happened to be doing a, a show at a at a. We did a spring fling show at I think it was USC, and um, 
you know, we did the show and Jimmy's is his regular excited self. You know how, how excited right. Jimmy is. <laughs> um, and I went away for 15 minutes just to do some press for like the local school paper. And when I came out of my trailer and our trailer is on the football field of the school at Spring Fling, and I walk down and I see Jimmy and the remaining nine members of the Roots. And I'm really dating myself with this reference. And an eight is enough human pyramid. Human pyramid. <laughs> and here's the thing about it. If that, if that visual wasn't striking enough, it's the fact, uh -huh. it's the fact that Tariq was on the bottom row. And if you know Tariq Luke Montrotter, right? If you know Tariq Luke Montrotter, mm -hmm. you will know that every outfit he ever wore was like either handmade or hand stitched or hand whatever. Very meticulously like we're the put of each together other. outfits. Dude, I will wear free old navy gear till I die. Meanwhile, Tariq's like, <laughs> Tariq has like Jesus without spot nor wrinkle sensibilities right. with his wardrobe. What did he say on that lap? I just heard a record uh, just now where he said, uh, "My my my cheapest t shirt costs four fifty. <laughs> yes, right. exactly. And so I was like, wait a minute. I know that those particular Japanese denim jeans are at least two thousand bucks. If Tariq is on the bottom row getting his <laughs> knees dirty with these immaculate jeans, <laughs> what the hell did Jimmy Fallon do in those 15 minutes that I left that disarmed them like that? Right. right. And I was with, because you, I mean, the thing is, you know us, Quali. You know sometimes we're snarky assholes. We're very, <laughs> like, you, you know us because you've been around right. us. Right. And I looked at Rich and I was like, yo. What just happened? And Rich mm -hmm. shrugged like, your guess is as good as mine. And I was like, we're not getting rid of this guy no time soon, are we? And wow. he just looked, we just looked how idiotic they looked trying to do a human <laughs> pyramid stacked on top of each other. <laughs> like it was the black version of Bring It On. Right. And I was just like, we're stuck with this guy. Like, because we right. were going to say no. We were just going to say no and just maintain a good relationship with him so that if we want to come on the show, then we have a home to come on the show. <laughs> right. But next thing you know, like in four months, like this is really happening. Like I'm about to not tour. And, you know, I I thought we were just going to have a, a quiet place to, to die, you know, because <laughs> I, I don't want I don't, I don't to sound that like that dark about it, but it was just the point where like, we do like an occasional show where like run DMC is opening for us. In my mm. mind, I'm like, wait, you guys sold out Madison square garden. Like we right. should be opening for you guys. Like, <laughs> you know, running them are just like, dog, we old, we just want to get do our 45 minute set and be out. <laughs> right, like right. they didn't care. <laughs> but in my mind, like, I was just like, one of these days we're going to like go back to South Street or that sort of like all this is going to be over. So I figured, mm -hmm. okay, well, we'll be on television and we'll do these 30 second music interstitials and we'll still make the same money and all the Roots kids will be healthy mm -hmm. and they'll spend time with their parents and mm -hmm. this this is where it ends. And I, I was fine with that. Um, and mm -hmm. I, re I really had that feeling at... The seed of that feeling that it was all over was the block party. Mm -hmm. When I got to the block party, that wasn't a happy day for me. That was like that was I felt like it was a funeral. I felt like mm -hmm. this this is gonna be the last time we're gonna be together. And it's never gonna be like it was at Electric Lady and us spinning you know, on each other's couches mm -hmm. and making music and collaborating. Like this is this is where it all ends. This this is where it ends. And What's weird is that that door, that door opportunity opened and then a new lease. I'd never once thought like, well, what if this works? Right. You know? Well, I mean, I, I um, <laughs> as a parent, I understand that as, as a touring musician, when you guys took the Jimmy Fallon t Tonight Show, I became the most tourist rapper. You know, it used to be the Roots. 
and then it was me. So I, I took over that that spot. And I mean, we're doing it here in Yellow Springs, Amir. So as I mean, the shack and what Dave is doing is bringing that energy back. Um, but it's, I want to ask it's you funny, about. Wait, it's it's funny you say that because I, I also have to say that you know when Moose was less relentless on his his the acting side of things. Mm-hmm then Common realized that's an opening for me. Right. And then what what makes what makes it even weirder is that when um Common started fully pursuing acting, then suddenly all the residue from like the B record that he was getting like his new lease on life, mm-hmm. suddenly those doors opened to us. So it's almost like everyone had their Yeah promotion moment uh you have a food book you've got a cookbook and you have a food show on food network so you've had really close relationship with chefs and of Mm -hmm. course you were friends with anthony bodine um can you talk a little bit about how you knew that food was going to be a part of your creative um output um when i told you earlier that you have to know who your starting five is and to know when to listen to wise people um and not given to the voice of sabotaging. So when my manager, Rich, was pretty much handed his death sentence uh, the last year of his life, he was told that, you know, you know, you got a year left to live. Uh, he had leukemia and he was deteriorating fast. Um, Rich's brain was, you know, one of the last organs to give out. So even in sort of this vegetated state or this non-mobile state of his, um, his mind was very much intact and sharp. And he spent the last four months of his life literally planning the next 25 years for me and Tariq. Mm -hmm. He spent Mm -hmm. two months on me, spent the last eight weeks of his life Mm. on him. Um, if you remember, you were you were around during the first run of the Dave Chappelle Radio City uh, Hall run. Yeah. Where he did those 10 weeks, not 10 weeks, uh, he did like 10 shows and, you know, he had like Nas uh, perform one night and the, that sort of thing. Um, and on our night, uh, I mean, occasionally he could muster up the strength to just have a regular conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a conversation. I didn't realize that was going to be my last conversation. He just, okay. uh, you know, we joked about the show that night. And I think I, I, I made a joke about Nas's, uh, drum patches being wrong for one love. And, uh, we were just laughing about that. And, um, then he said, uh, he told me, he says, well, I gave da da da, um, some instructions I need you to follow. And I was like, instructions? And I didn't realize that at the time, like he was just basically, he knew that it was done and he gave the designated uh, project overseers this like 25 year manifesto. Um, And two days later he went to a coma and then he he died. And so I looked at the man, I looked at the manifesto and me and my project leader, um, and we're like six years into it. And literally, he just laid a step-by-step program. In the beginning, I was just like, the food world, what? <laughs> and I was like, what the hell I got to do in the food world? Right. And he even had an answer. Like, it was sort of like, in case you're skeptical or that sort of thing about this, like, Look at you. You obviously love food. You might as well, <laughs> and you overanalyze everything else. You might as well figure out the science of food the way that you figure out breakbeats. Mm. And in the beginning, I had trepidation about it because it's just like, with, I often have imposter syndrome with uh, sort of new areas in my life that I'm not too sure about. And um, I got to say that, you know, Graciously, before his passing, Anthony Bourdain was like initiated me into the the chef mafia. Um, 
I just have, I have a genuine love and appreciation for it. The reason why I admire chefs, like chefs and comedians are probably the two people that I like hanging out with most because I like to see how their creativity works. And the, the, the difference, but the difference in between musicians and comedians have that chefs don't get is that with chefs, you like with a musician, I can make a mistake and not let you know that it's a mistake and make it part of my art. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a chef, you pretty much have to go to bat and hit a grand slam instantly um, without without mistakes. And there's no there's no places for jam sessions or, you know, or to work on your material and that sort of thing. Like. And so to me, I'm always curious at the at the pressure that a chef has to like be creative, but yet not too experimental that you, you know, give it up. Like one of the chefs in that book, I did something to food about. He had a he had a dish called trash. And he literally fed me everything that should not be consumed. Eyeballs, uh, cartilage, shells you know, the parts of the food that you're supposed to throw away in compost. And he made it the tastiest meal I ever had in my life. Yeah. And it was hard eating wow. eyeballs. Wow. Trust me. <laughs> um, but that's when I realized shit was art. But then like a, a course later, he he gives me a banana split and it's a toss salad. And I'm like, what's this? He's like, it's banana split. I was like, you're just calling it that? He said, taste it. And I tasted it and I'm like, wait, why do the cherries taste like strawberries and the lettuce tastes like caramel? And so to me, I, I just always had a fascination on how things get made. So just like music, I, I've entered that world. So, I mean, as of now, I think that I've dwelled in that area. Um, I'm getting more into uh, sort of food advocacy and and getting into a, a place where um, I'm trying to, I figured out a lane that I can get into is try to develop as much clean foods as I can. Yeah. Um, because I've definitely lived a, a toxic life of, you know, I mean, for a good part of my life, I was way 400 plus pounds, um, always one breath away from a, a cardiac arrest. Mm. One of those nights at the, I, I just told Common that I, um, that at the Roots Picnic, New York, in Bryant Park, uh, I had a moment during his set where my heart was about to give out, mm. and I thought this this might be the end, mm. that sort of thing, and um, I had to get my life together. So you know, and, and that's the thing, like. We we grew up in an era where like you could get shot at the club, you know, where you could be twenty four years old and dead. And now that we're in our forties and almost fifties, like the new version of that is, we could easily um, get a stroke. Like I'm prime candidate for that. Mm. And so, I, I I felt like now is the time to walk the walk and talk the talk. So, um, first by example. I mean, I'm like 100 plus pounds smaller. I'm going for another 100, I'm trying to get down to 220. That's really dumb. Um, so, thank you. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get to a place where I can introduce our people to oh. sustainable foods and snacks uh, that won't put them in jeopardy. Because none of these things were around. Like you couldn't get a tossed salad in my part of the neighborhood where I grew up. You was just you know. telling me about a uh, carbless bread. Yes, there's there's <laughs> carbless bread that I just discovered. Uh, shout out to Lynn's Life, L Y N N S L I F E. She she has a form of celiac that will pretty much almost end her life if she even looks at bread the wrong way. So mm. she can't even have nuts. So she eats mm. seeds. I didn't know that nuts and seeds are two different things. So. Mm-hmm. She's a lover of like muffins and bagels and crackers mm-hmm. and bread. And so she figured out a way to make um, biscuit mix- mixes and, and muffin mixes and all these things, cinnamon buns, um, without using any uh, starch or flour or nuts, any of those types of things. And so okay. um, 
that's that's where that's part of my mission now like just investing in those types of of, of companies and bringing them to our people cuz i also think it's weird that that's a that's a weird form of like nutritional gentrification like yeah. why is it mm-hmm. why is the cheaper option always the unhealthy option oh yeah right. why is it right. why does it cost so much to get your life right with the right foods right so there's there's a lot in there unpacking. So yeah, I'm I'm really about food advocacy now. If I was to come to your house right now or to Yellow Springs, what would be your go to dish to make me? You know what? I am not going to Yes, I have the ability to cook well. And this is not me pulling a, a, a saboteur imposter syndrome thing because Tariq is actually a better chef than he is an MC. Wow. I saw his mm. Instagram. He's doing like cooking shows on his IG live. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to develop. We're, I'm, we're trying to develop uh, a platform for him right now. My interest in the food world is less about cooking the food myself, even though I've had many a lesson and I, I'm able to cook. Um, I just think it's, it's such an art form that's not seen as an art form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just I'd I'd like to shine a light and show the parallels of how musicians think and how chefs think and how comedians, which is why I'm here. I'm here to watch Dave be a genius. Right. He's the funniest person ever. But I will right now, like Dave is my prince. Mm. So there is mm. no place in the world where I won't travel to to see him perform. And I've seen him perform a gazillion times over and. Just like in that way, I would see Prince where I would cherish that moment and knows that I see genius mm-hmm. and that I see like a, a, a historic moment happening. Right. Like I consider my like him allowing me to watch his process of comedy the same way. Like there's no day performance that I've not seen that I haven't taken into account that I'm watching uh, Charlie Parker or Duke Ellington or Prince or, or Jay Monk. Diller or any... Or monk, any of those things. First of all, thank you for your time, brother. This has been wonderful. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I, before, I rarely do this, man. Like I'm, I'm the you. one that's always asking the questions. This is this is fun. I'm glad that you sat with us for this amount of time. But I don't know if I mean I haven't had Black Thoughts cooking, but I can't imagine that he does too many things better than being MC. And Dude, I told you that hot ninety seven freestyle ain't shit compared to his Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. Mm. Well, let's. I want to talk about that freestyle for a second. Now, Act Two. First of all, when I heard this song, Act Two, Love of My Life, I shed a tear, and that's real. This is, you know, um, yeah, that song almost made me, almost didn't make it. Almost didn't make it. Man, uh, Zap Mama, Common, uh, Black Thoughts verse, Black Thoughts verse on that song encapsulates a large part of my life. You know, I step into the stage with my eyes closed and push back the impact, push back the first five rows. All that stuff is like that's how I felt feel as an MC as a superhero. Um, that he, song almost never made the album. Wow. Tariq hated that song. I loved it. <laughs> but now go back to the Funkmaster Flex freestyle. He called me after that freestyle. He was like, yo, Quad, niggas really, really fuck with that freestyle. I'm like, do you not, do you not know who you are? And so I guess my question is, since I've heard stories that sometimes Black Thought will start working on solo stuff and then it'll get uh pulled into whatever the roots is doing, he became right. very very prolific after the Funkmaster Flex freestyle. I went to see him in the studio. He was like, I'm dropping an album every month. The first album will be Knife Wonder. The next album will be D- me and Dap Kings. Next album will be mm-hmm. me and uh, Salam Remy. Now, he only got two of those out, or maybe three of them out. Two of them out, he right? He just made an announcement. July 31st, Volume 3 is coming out. Okay, so when him he and, said Him it to and Sean, uh, Sean C. Sean C, right. So when he said yeah. it to me, um, me, me being someone who has put out a lot of records... I knew, I was like, there's no way you're going to drop a record every month. That's ambitious, but I'll be surprised if you're able to do that. But he, right. at, least, at least he got out the Knife Wonder record. Um, mm-hmm. Why is it, and I have my own thoughts, that people don't, unless you really do this music for a living, people don't understand that Black Thought is absolutely like the best MC. You know what it's like? Okay, so there's a moment, there's a moment when, when, um, there's a moment when Kid A came out by Radiohead. Mm-hmm. 
and the buzz was so heavy on Radiohead, like in, in, in a deafening, undeniable way that OK Computer sort of opened the door to, but really Kid A finished with, mm-hmm. that it's almost like you weren't cool if you weren't down with Radiohead. Right, right, right. So oftentimes I felt like, like I would, like my manager, Sean and Tariq will always ask the second question. Oh yeah. What songs do you like? And I'm like, oh, come on y'all. Like, you know, good and well, everyone likes the Erica Badu song. Right. And oh, I like, we got the hot music or oh, I like that song from the best they, man soundtrack. Wait, wait. So they call it. We got the hot. We <laughs> that's the name they of the song. They never right? ever. They <laughs> never say you got me. They always say right. the Erica Badu song. Right. They say we got the hot music. The song <laughs> from the Best Man soundtrack. You know, like I mean, like diehards will be like, you know, they'll they'll say it by name, but for the most part, I always knew that the idea of the roots was actually bigger than the actual roots, and I know that I make. I mean, I make albums. I'd like to think I make albums that. I would like to buy, but oftentimes, like, I shy away from the singles. Like, mm-hmm. for me, the, the the defining tone of an artist is what his filler is. Like, Stevie Wonder is a great case in point. Like, all my favorite Stevie Wonder songs are songs that are not singles. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, you know, with, with, with The Roots, I think the idea of liking us is cool. And we, and you know, we, we structure it so that there's something for everybody. There are people that know us for just like all these mammoth solos that we used to do in the show. Mm-hmm. There's people only remember the last 15 minutes, like, Oh, when Rozelle did the beatbox or in the time mm-hmm. when Kamal did the mob deep part of this song, right, right, you know, right. like did that sample. But, um, you know, oftentimes, man, it's just like, Tariq, Tariq is too, too, too good for his own good. And that rule in the 48 laws of power, which you're not supposed to, you can't outshine the teacher, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I definitely know that there was some of that going on as well. Often, often, you know, with, with, our peers and stuff, you know, and it, actually, you know, what? I think Jay, I think Jay told me once, like the logic of, cause he wanted to re when Jay heard, uh, Tariq's verse in I will not apologize. Yeah. A record I'm on. Oh, that's right. You're on a, mm. I told, I was like, Quali, there's a song called I, I Will Not Apologize. I don't know if <laughs> I you mean, heard y'all, it. y'all tell me what to say. Y'all was using me for my voice, but I'm still appreciating. I'm right. I totally forgot. Like, You're doing the hook. Yeah, right. So Jay had this, this uh, wide open thing, like finally, like, and I'm like, wait, 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 finally what? Finally. And it was sort of like, he was like, finally y'all listen to me because Tariq does such a simple rhythmic pattern there. That's easy to apologize. An easy pattern that you can follow in the da 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 da. And that's one of the rare times in which he almost like spoon feeds you a simple rhyme pattern that right. your brain can follow. Whereas normally he's just like, you know, it's like crazy taxi. Like, where's he going? Where's he going? Where's he? You know, it's like trying to use a fly swatter on a, a fly that you can't t- kill. That's and a great metaphor. That's what Tariq is like. And, you know, Jay, I, I was kind of asking, like, you know, like, can't we get him, like, can't you use your influence to get him? And I'm talking to Jay, the the record president of Def Jam at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, we got to get him on more features. And that, like, that's the thing. Like, get him on those things. And he was just like, the, 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 the logic of that thinking is, like, oftentimes people will want to co-sign something new. Like, you felt that definitely when I mean, there's a get by remix with everybody and their mother on it, Snoop, right. Jay, it, and like uh, that sort on, of thing. On that remix, I only got eight bars on that remix. Most got twenty four bars. Kanye got twenty four bars because when I gave Kanye the record to listen to, I had done I had just demoed up a first eight bars. I was gonna come back, but Kanye and most recorded a verse and took it to DJ enough, 
and th- before I even got to finish my verse. So I got the Dang. shortest verse on the Goodbye <laughs> Remix. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, all right. So he tells me, like, you know, he's like, he's like, the problem with thought is, you know, it's bad when the, the first line is, the problem with thought is, mm-hmm. he's like, you know, it's one thing where it's like a super established artist you know pulls a move and i think he was sort of sort of uh suggesting the renegade situation mm-hmm. you know yeah with like and, and without directly like that 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 nas line of like eminem ate you up on your own shit mm-hmm. that did a lot to establish mcs at the time where it's like yeah. oh i cannot afford i can't afford it's one thing to get sunned by an established person but you know, the days of just letting Buster, you know, like t- Q-Tip was very gracious. Like, okay, I'm going to use my platform on my classic ass album to just, instead of me getting my rocks off, I'm going to throw you an alley-oop and go mm-hmm. ahead, Buster, take it home. Just do your... Right, right, right. <sighs> Mr. Buster like, And that's the moment. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Q-Tip took a, a... Q-Tip had to lay out the red carpet for Buster to come on there and kill it. You know what I mean? And the days of that... Are are far and few between, and he, you know, Jay told me in no certain terms that you know no rapper can really afford to look bad in front of him. So mm. it's almost like huh. we gotta blackball him. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Jay Z for seeing the big picture here. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it was a hard pill to swallow. It's like yo, like. And then I feel guilty because it's sort of like I'm the mascot of the roots and people default to me. And, you know, it's like, well, let's use a mirror. And, you know, so it's like I get these opportunities of like, OK, I'll make the voodoo record with you. OK, I'll make this record. With, you know, I'm like I'm having my moment in the summer where I get to collaborate with and play reindeer games. And Puerto Rico is like Rudolph, like he's not allowed to play reindeer games. I'm going to tell you, like, I didn't even tell him this this shit, mm-hmm. man. Like I I cried. I cried hard because I was just like, when I heard that Hot 97 freestyle, I cried, man, because it was mm. just like, it's been a long, long time mm. coming for him to finally get his roses in a way where, and you know, he's not too big on like wearing his heart on his sleeve in public mm. and all that stuff. Like he's mystery, never lets you see his eyes and wears his hats. Mm. Like he's mm. he's very low key like that. And you know, things aren't supposed to bother him. All right, well, keep it moving. Keep it moving. And right. um, just for that moment, like, to see him trending and seeing people, like, write out the lyrics and teach them and all those things and yeah. really get, like, so I'm happy to say, like, right now he's the most interesting member of the Roots, and I'm a, I'm a happy second banana in this case, which I'm fine <laughs> with that. <laughs> well, I mean... You made a uh, Rudolph metaphor. Rudolph is the hero, the unsung hero of that story. Um, right. Shout out to Black Thought. He's working on that play, the musical uh, production. It's it's brilliant. Black no more. He, he Dog, makes me feel yes. like I'm not doing enough with my life, you know. And um, man, shout out to the Roots in general, man. I love y'all, Thank you. y'all brotherhood. Thank you. Um, I love how loyal y'all are to each other. And ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Quest Love on the People's Party. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate you guys for putting up with my fireside chats. Oh, we love uh, it. <laughs> <laughs>